Welcome to Focus on Scholarship. I'm Jala Rizai, Associate Dean of Graduate Education and Research, and your host for today's session. Our goal at graduate school and university libraries is to bring a focus and awareness to the exciting scholarly and creative achievements of our academic community. Our guest today is Dr. Linda Frost, an Associate Professor of English and Director of the Honors Program at Eastern Kentucky University. Linda is a scholar of 19th century American literature and culture. She's the author of Never One Nation, Freaks, Savages, and Whiteness in U.S. Popular Culture. She was the founding editor of the award-winning all-women's literary magazine called PMS, Poem Memoir Story. She has published both poetry and creative nonfiction in various journals and magazines over the years. Today we are going to focus on her most recent work as the editor of Conjoined Twins in Black and White, The Lives of Millie Christine McCoy and Daisy and Violet Hilton. Welcome to our program, Linda. Thank you. Uh, please tell us a little bit about uh, the Conjoined Twins. This particular collection um, includes two memoirs, two autobiographies that have not been published before. They were published in various ways as ephemera in the 19th century and early 20th century, but they've not appeared in any kind of scholarly edition. Um, there's uh, an autobiography written by uh, the sister set, Millie Christine McCoy, who were born into slavery in 1851 in North Carolina, I believe. And then uh, the second memoir is by Daisy and Violet Hilton, who were born in England in 1908 and, and moved to the United States when they were relatively young and um, lived most of their life here. The book also includes, though, not just these memoirs or these autobiographies, but also um, two other texts for each sister set. So each, um, with each set of conjoined twins, I included what's called a freak history, uh, or sometimes called a show history, which was a biography written about them, for them, um, and sold at their performances and their exhibitions. Usually there are texts that were written by managers. We don't know who wrote them for the most part. Um, then in the case of each twin, I also include one other text that was published during their lifetime that is not necessarily an autobiography or even a biography, no matter how bad that biography might be, uh, not, not either of those, but actually a text that also rewrites their life in some way that is useful to another sort of stakeholder. So in the case of Millie Christine McCoy, they actually call themselves Millie Christine McCoy, one hyphenated mm -hmm. name. Um, it's uh, an article written by William Pancoast, who was a gynecologist in Philadelphia, uh, a kind of medical article about the twins. And then in the case of Daisy and Violet Hilton, it's a, well, it's not a screenplay, it's a short story that was used as the basis of a screenplay for a film that they acted in and that they helped to produce uh, called Chained for Life. It's an awful film, <laughs> but, um, but it's a short story, again, using their life in a very different way. Uh, this is absolutely fascinating. <laughs> uh, and, and the term that I was fascinated in when I was reading the book was the term freak that it's used. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you, is that academically uh, acceptable right. term to use? Yeah, I, certainly not in most contexts, right? Um, but in the, I think it, was, it came out in the 1990s, a book by Robert Bogdan. He was a special education professor at Syracuse University. And he really wrote, uh, there have been other books written about the notion of freak shows or the freak, and I'll keep doing that annoying little quotation thing. Um, but Bogdan's book, it was called Freak Show, was absolutely foundational in terms of finding a way to talk about this whole phenomenon of the freak show and the, the representation and performance of people with extraordinary congenital abnormalities or simply represented culturally as extraordinary in some way. Um, and his book actually found uh, a way to academically and in terms of a scholarly context talk about these people and the, the whole sort of history of the freak show as an American institution in some way. Not unique to America, but certainly it had a very different life and sort of um, uh, a different energy in the United States. 
That, that is fascinating. But tell me, how did you get involved or interested in the freak show? In the freak show. Um, I was actually, my first book, Never One Nation, is a book looking at um, the way in which 19th century periodicals, newspapers, cheesy periodicals, uh, what they called story papers, weekly newspapers, um, configured notions of Americanness differently in different parts of the country. And when I was looking at the New York press, I, was, I kept seeing advertisements for Barnum's American Museum. And I found out that one of the main editors I was working with, Frank Leslie, had actually designed and engraved um, Barnum's first catalog for his American Museum. So uh, you can't really deal with 19th century popular culture and not encounter the freak show. Mm -hmm. So I just started to sort of look at the kind of things that were represented. And I got very interested in one particular um, freak exhibit. Um, and she's on the cover of the book. She was the Circassian beauty, is what they were called. Um, and these were women that were um, supposedly uh, taken, bought at slave markets in Constantinople and saved from slavery in the harems um, in, in that part of the world. And these, the Circassian beauty in particular was supposed to be a woman from the Caucasus, Caucasus region, I can never say that, from Russia, mm -hmm. um, who was both at one point very sexualized but at the same time depicted as the whitest of white. She was both, you know, seen as being in a place that, in terms of different kinds of 19th century thought, was the origin of all whiteness. So I was pretty interested in that. She was uh, a freak that started, started to show up in popular culture in 1863, which is a very important moment because that is the moment of emancipation in the United States. Mm -hmm. So she became kind of, for me, the representation of something I called emancipation anxiety, which was the idea of what happens in the United States when the slaves are actually freed. One of the things that's interesting about the Circassian beauty is she looks nothing like a woman would have looked like from that actual region. She has always in the images a huge afro. Mm -hmm. um, and these were actually women that were played by Norwegian women or Irish women um, that came into Barnum's Museum and he fixed their hair up, teased it in beer, and gave them sort of a storyline. So these were freaks that were not um, congenital, uh, uh, people with some kind of congenital abnormality. They were sort of culturally used by the freak show. Mm 